Anatomy Trains is delighted to announce a brand new dissection live stream specialty class on September 18th, Lumbo-Pelvic Stability, a one-day layered dissection with Anatomy Trains author Tom Myers and master dissector Todd Garcia. The early bird price of $150 is held until September 10th. After September 10th, the price is $250. Come see the body's actual core for yourself. This course will be provided over Zoom webinar with multiple camera views, live chat, and Q&A. Visit anatomytrains.com to sign up. This episode is brought to you by the Massage Mentor Institute. Diane Metkowski, also known as the Massage Mentor, and Allison Denny, also known as Rebel Massage, have teamed up to bring you the Massage Mentor Institute. MMI is a collection of teachings and education opportunities from industry leaders around the world because your continuing education experience should be whatever you want it to be. They are building community one body part at a time, and they want you to be a part of it. Head over to the massagementorinstitute.com today to see more, learn more, and do more. As a massage therapist, I'm always opening my computer and Googling information about issues and dysfunctions I want to or need to know more about. Most of the time, I find articles and videos that are informative, but a bit boring. I accepted that this is the way it was until I found Paul. Paul Ingram is the owner and publisher of the website painscience.com a website about aches and pains that gives no BS science-based advice to both professionals and patients. Paul was a practicing massage therapist for 10 years before he slowly transitioned to his full-time occupation of writing and researching in 2010. Painscience.com is a library of insight, including 227 featured articles, 10 book-length tutorials, 971 smaller blog posts, and, and this is my favorite part, 3,000-plus scientific paper citations. Paul's assemblage of words are over 2 million, which is, as he puts it, bigger than the Game of Thrones. He has attracted an equally impressive number of readers and continues to forge through the research and bring us content that is thorough, funny, and offers a unique perspective into the baffling world of chronic pain. When opening his website, you'll find a salamander hanging out at the top. Of course, I wanted to know why. Uh, my my salamander is he, he is a logo. He functions as a as a logo, but I think of him as a mascot. Uh, and he was uh, created by an artist named Gary Lyons many years ago, early, early in the business. And uh, I just liked him. He was cute. <laughs> He's got a nice vibe. And uh, I knew as soon as I saw that piece of artwork, yep, that's, yep, that's going to be the symbol for my work. And of course, it is a symbol. It's the the salamander who is nameless, by the way. We, I, don't, I don't even have a private nickname for him. He's just the salamander. Uh, he, he, salamanders have truly miraculous healing powers. Uh, in a in a world that is short on real miracles, the salamander does them as a matter of routine. And specifically, what's notable about salamanders is that they're they're the largest. Uh, they're the they're the only macroscopic vertebrate organism that does full regeneration. There are lots of microscopic organisms that do regeneration, but they're microscopic and microbes and tiny organisms are bizarre and have all kinds of weird properties that macroscopic organisms do not. But the salamander is a, an animal and yet it can regrow entire limbs. Uh, all the anatomy of an entire limb can be recreated from scratch in the salamander's biology. And the fact that that is possible is a source of great inspiration to me, that nature has this trick, that it can do this thing. It is, uh, it, it is a source of constant inspiration and a wonderful symbol for health and healing and regeneration. So that is the backstory for the salamander. But Paul doesn't write about salamanders or regeneration. He writes about chronic pain. He suffered a bit himself from this, but was intrigued with his patients and their stories of pain that just did not have a resolve. And I was originally inspired simply by the desire to help 
um, other people who had it. And um, of course, almost everyone has some experience with chronic pain. I mean, who hasn't had a stubborn pain that won't go? And it's almost like the dark side of the salamander's regenerative ability. It's almost the, you know, it's the curse version. If the regenerative powers of the salamander are a miracle, then chronic pain is, uh, is a curse. The strange failure to get over um, something that hurts. And I saw patients who had these problems as a young massage therapist, and I wanted to help them with that. And there was never time in spite of the fact that one of the one of the coolest things about being a massage therapist was that I had time uh, to spend with people, which was, you know, the most, it's the most precious commodity in healthcare. And I could give more time to my patients than any doctor could, and even most physical therapists, but it still wasn't enough. And so I felt quite a strong need to give people educational resources and they didn't exist. I wanted to tell people stuff I didn't have time to tell them. So I started writing it down. I had always been a writer. I am a writer before anything else. I will be a writer to the end. Uh, writing defines me. So it was very natural for me to just start writing about the things that I was trying to help people with and send them home and uh, email them a link to an article on my website, which was super primitive at that time, but that's how <laughs> it started. It was, they were basically um, office brochures that I put on a website in the early 2000s. So he may have always been a writer, but I wanted to hear how he got into the world of massage therapy. I needed a good day job <laughs> because I was a writer. And at that point in my career, I had completely failed to make a living as a writer. I had, I had already struck out repeatedly as writers often do, especially when they're young. And, uh, and I simply needed a day job. Um, the, I had actually just finished this bizarre, very, um, very hippie thing to do. Uh, some of your listeners will have heard of the WOOF program, the uh, Willing Workers on Organic Farms, WWOOF. I spent a year working as an itinerant farmer on organic farms, um, trading work for a place to sleep and food to eat. And at the end of that, I had no job, no money, no prospects, and I I basically just started thinking in terms of what what would be what suits me temperamentally and would be the perfect day job for a writer. And I landed on massage therapy. His training in Canada was exceptional, which gave him a lot of confidence, and he felt immediately that he could help people with their chronic pain issues. Training in Canada for massage therapy is fragmented just like the States, but the provinces in Canada that have uh, better quality training have particularly good training. Uh, these days, it's a 2000 hour program is standard, I think, in BC and Ontario and maybe a couple other provinces. And my apologies to any listeners who know better. I don't keep tabs on this. Right. Um, but uh, but significantly to my own story, I trained as a massage therapist in the brief window when British Columbia was absolutely determined to make uh, massage therapists top tier allied healthcare professionals. And, uh, and we had talked ourselves into a 3,000 hour training program. So I did a three year full time program, uh, which in, in retrospect, I wouldn't do it again. Mm. Um, but, you know, at the time, it seemed absolutely premium chef's kiss. Mwah. It seemed amazing at the time. Right. And, uh, and so I got, you know, for, for a massage therapist, I got a lot of training and spent a lot of tuition money on it. And so mm -hmm. I, I chose massage, massage therapy for a lot of, of reasons, but it was a, it wasn't just any day job. It was a particularly good day job. And it was a day job where I could do something that, that actually felt meaningful to me. Whereas, you know, very often artists will do just whatever pays the bills. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was getting older at that point. I was, I think I was pushing 30 in my training and I didn't want to work as a server in a restaurant. I wanted to do something that felt more meaningful to me. And uh, massage therapy seemed like a terrific way to pay the bills while also helping people and doing something that felt good to me. 
Even with all of this training, though, Paul found himself in a situation most of us can relate to, seeing clients whose pain is persistent and not being able to quote unquote fix them. I, I think that, that humility came to me hard and fast. I think um, that I, I cooked up the idea of pitching myself as an as a advanced troubleshooter as a marketing concept, uh, just, an, just an eager beaver you know, junior therapist. And then the, the clinical reality of the kinds of patients who came to see me uh, almost immediately um, deeply humbled me. And I realized that I was out of my depth. And, and to be honest, I, I didn't really market myself for long as a, as a fix-it guy. What I transitioned into pretty quickly was a science-based therapist, a rational therapist, one who would you know, take the time to do the, my very best to help people with their stubborn pain. But I, I pretty quickly stopped claiming to be able to fix anyone when I realized I couldn't. And I saw so many tricky clinical cases that were clearly, you know, I was just out of my depth and I didn't know the half of it. And that, that expression isn't even adequate. I didn't know the 10th of it to this day. I am still learning about startling ways that people can be in severe chronic pain that I'd never heard of. It's incredible how many there are. And that's from someone who does nothing but study and write about this stuff all day, every day for over a decade now. And I'm still coming across examples of, oh, wow, I didn't know that could happen. So it, it's it, it didn't take long for me to realize that I was out of my depth. So he scrambled and he researched and he began writing. His writing soon went down the rabbit hole called chronic pain and the lack of knowledge we have around it. I want every um, every beginning therapist, I want every, every therapist to understand that uh, this is, chronic pain is the hardest problem that there is. Nuclear fusion is easier. Rocket science is easier. This, it, 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 any failure to help someone in pain is not your fault and not because you're limited or you don't know something that other therapists do. It's because we are surprisingly ignorant. I think that part of the reason, uh, I, I mean, when I say we are surprisingly ignorant, I mean, the human species remains surprisingly ignorant of how these things work. And one of the reasons that I was able to transition away from, I, I can fix you, uh, confidence to um, much greater humility quite early in my career is because it, you don't have to look at the research for very long before you start realizing that we don't have the answers, that no one has the answers. And, you know, I, I had this advanced, um, you know, training program. And you would think that, you know, given, given that back pain is the number one thing that patients bring to massage therapists, you you'd think that we would have a pretty good good understanding of what to do with those patients but about i think it was probably about 4 or 5 years into my career uh my my best study buddy from uh, from massage therapy college uh called me up she she knew that i was a thinker and uh and she called me up and she said i just i just don't know what to do with back pain can we talk about this? I just don't know. I thought I did when I started out and I graduated. I thought I knew what to do, but the, the more I do this, the more I think I just don't know what to do. And we had a chat about it. And the, you know, the, 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 the punchline of the conversation was basically, yeah, me neither. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's there, there are no good, clean answers to these questions. The science of musculoskeletal medicine is shockingly primitive. And, uh, and so it is, there's simply no shame in not knowing. The only shame is in not knowing that you don't know. Embrace the fact that you, 
that we only know any of us 1% of what there is to know. And the, the most expert experts know 5% or 7%. And the rest is still mystery. It's for future generations to work out. Unfortunately, though, this seemed to hit a nerve for many people. Paul's openness about the lack of knowledge around chronic pain, combined with his sense of humor, created some obstacles. So many obstacles, in fact, that Paul had to reassess his path. The short version of the story is pretty pretty easy and simple. Um, people got upset that I was calling out uh, problems with pseudoscience in our profession and others. Um, and that I was doing so in a fairly, you know, casual and snarky tone. Um, my early writing style was pretty, I mean, it, in retrospect, it seems very tame, <laughs> really. And even at the time, I knew that there were other debunkers who were much um, harsher than I was. But I, I have a knack. I have a certain style <laughs> that's good at pushing people's buttons and uh, some some of the powers to be got upset and started an investigation, uh, essentially, you know, concerned that my publishing was, you know, constituted uh, professional misconduct, um, which was a bit rich. Uh, the, you know, the, the idea that this was worthy of time and attention uh, relative to, you know, issues of serious moral turpitude, like, you know, sexual abuse of, of clients and, it just wasn't in the same league as anything else that the uh, that the college normally investigated. It uh, it got a little out of hand. I you know throughout the entire uh, process, which went you know dragged on for about three years. I just I always figured uh, this will blow over. It's just a bit too silly <laughs> to to actually take seriously. But it didn't blow over, and it just <laughs> kept going and. My license was at stake. I mean, it, it could it could have escalated to uh, to a full scale inquiry and been extremely expensive and highly problematic for me. So it got got really stressful. And fortunately for me, at the same time that all this was going on, my website was becoming popular. And so I was able to make the choice. I, I was able to say, um, I quit before anyone tried to fire me. <laughs> and so I did. I left the profession in 2010, uh, you know, in a bit of a you know, flurry of melodrama. Um, I didn't have to go. I, I almost certainly could have stayed and it would have been fine. Uh, but at the time, uh, I, you know, was honestly pretty glad to say goodbye. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't feeling the love <laughs> from my profession. And this is, you know, this was kind of the, the ultimate expression of a problem that, you know, is at the center of my writing career um, the whole time, which is that the things I have to say upset a lot of readers. A lot of it is very controversial. I tip over a lot of sacred cows. I challenge a lot of popular beliefs. And uh, 99% of the time, that just results in a reader who, who says, who is this guy? Who does, who does he think he is? Challenging right. my beliefs. How dare he? <laughs> uh, but every now and then, it turns into a legal threat uh, or bizarre harassment uh, or the pseudo-legal threat that I encountered with the, uh, with the regulatory agency. Paul is not pushing buttons just to push buttons. His dive into cognition is an attempt to understand the crux of the problem he faced as a massage therapist. How we think about pain is fundamental to how we heal. This is kind of a meta game for me is I've never been just about my subject matter, but about about the craft and skill of thinking itself. That is very important to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's it's motivated by the same thing that drives me to go straight to the research. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I want to, I, I don't want to hear from a guru. I want to go to the data. Same, mm -hmm. same drive. I also want to know how to think. Readers are are often triggered by something relatively early in a uh, in an article. 
something that bothers them, rubs them the wrong way. They then cast me in the role of massage therapy enemy number one. And everything else they read, if they read any more at all, is seen through that filter. And they now they have it, what right. we would call a cognitive bias, mm-hmm. um, where they see what they want to see and expect to see. And so every single thing that they read after that is, is like, how does that fit my picture of this guy as somebody who hates massage therapy, which I don't, I really don't, but you can see that very strongly in the, in the hate mail over the years is that, is that they're, they're arguing with, um, with, with something that isn't actually there. They're arguing with, with who they imagine me to be Mm -hmm. and what they imagine my values to be and not who I actually am, or even what I actually said. Mm -hmm. And that happens all the time. I wanted to know, though, that in the context of the craft and skill of thinking itself, what his thoughts are about the power of the mind. There are a lot of different modalities in the massage therapy world, and sometimes what works for one person might not work for another. Let's let's think about it in terms of the active ingredient of uh, a treatment. Any kind of treatment has, in theory, something in it, some component, some active ingredient that does the business, does the work, actually makes a difference for the patient who has a real need. Uh, Something's wrong, and hopefully what we're doing actually makes it better. The biggest problem with active ingredients in alternative medicine broadly is that there are active ingredients, but they typically aren't what we think they are. There's a lot of mythology and, um, and drama and story and history and pop culture around our ideas about what the active ingredient is and what it's doing. People seem to have good experiences. They're satisfied a lot with, uh, with their care. Uh, patients swear by things. They sing their praises. Uh, but the active ingredient is usually not what anyone thinks it is, either the person delivering the care or the person receiving it. By far the dominant active ingredient in most healthcare, especially for pain, is the therapeutic interaction and expectations. So it's not that someone finally finds a therapy that works for them, it's that they find a therapy pissed who works for them. Mm -hmm. They find a relationship that works for them. And this is a very complicated idea. And why this works is a, a long story. And why the active ingredients we believe in aren't actually the active ingredients that we think they are also a very long story. But let me give a, a simple example of how to understand how badly we get this wrong. Because it's, it's really important, talking humility again, really important to put this in historical context and understand just how wrong this can go. And the history of quackery and snake oil is absolutely chock-a-block with dire examples of things that people passionately believed were effective. But today, absolutely everyone, even most people in alternative medicine can easily look back and say, well, that's garbage. That's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But more than that, dangerous. That the actual active, the active ingredient that we once thought that thousands of people swore by, that millions of people swore by, wasn't just ineffective and silly. It was damaging. It was killing them. Mm -hmm. And yet, they swore by it. Mm -hmm. This simple fact, looking back into history, knowing the history of nostrums and snake oils and, you know, the golden age of selling literally anything to people, (laughs) um, you know, great American tradition. There was were decades and decades of this where just absolutely bonkers stuff was sold to people. And it wasn't just silly and quaint and, oh, those old timey people, what were they thinking? It was dangerous. There were things that were absolutely lethal 
-hmm. and yet people swore by them. That is the power of the mind. The mind is indeed powerful. And Paul is the first to admit that even with all of the science and the data, the subject of chronic pain justifies the use of words like slippery, messy, and definitely maybe. I I see my job as translation and communication. I am not an expert in chronic pain or musculoskeletal health care, although obviously I picked up a thing or two. Um, But I really, I see myself as a communicator, as a, uh, and translation is particularly important in this field because just just read a scientific paper abstract. I, it'll it, it it will bore you to sleep. They're terrible. They're absolutely terrible. And in many cases, as a professional writer, not a scientist, not a researcher, as a professional writer, what I see is a writing problem. I mean that that stuff is just boring. It's just badly written. And you see that in scientific papers all the time. Or like, well, if, if I were a college professor and this were handed in to me as a, as a term paper, I would be covered in red. Like, don't use the passive voice here. For God's sake, punch it up. Um, so as a translator, my number one job is just to make, just to make it clearer and use plain English, which, uh, thank God, scientists are bad writers. But just as scientists can have a difficult time communicating their research, massage therapists can struggle with their own pain. Paul has a personal relationship with chronic pain, which he shares on his website. From his experience, he has learned that acceptance is part of the solution. It certainly got to a point where I realized if I, if I don't just start accepting that this is how it is, then I'm going to spend my, you know, my entire waking existence frustrated and pissed off. And I don't want that. Um, So at least some of the time, I now say, "Eh, all right, so I'm a glitchy guy on with the show. (laughs) I, for one, am thankful that he is translating and communicating. He has helped thousands of massage therapists and patients to navigate the mysterious world of chronic pain. Paul's journey from body worker to chronic pain translator is a gift that humility brought to him. The idea that we can know everything is overwhelming. Accepting those things that we cannot control can open doors we never knew existed. For more free translations and communications from Paul Ingram, you can check out his website, www.painscience.com. And if you appreciate his work, his downloadable eBooks are worth every penny. Members are loving ABMP 5-Minute Muscles and ABMP Pocket Pathology, two quick reference web apps included with ABMP membership. ABMP 5-Minute Muscles delivers muscle-specific palpation and technique videos plus origins, insertions, and actions for the 83 muscles most commonly addressed by body workers. ABMP Pocket Pathology, created in conjunction with Ruth Werner, puts key information for nearly 200 common pathologies at your fingertips and provides the knowledge you need to help you make informed treatment decisions. Start learning today. ABMP members, log in at abmp.com and look for the links in the Featured Benefits section of your member homepage. Not a member? Learn about these exciting member benefits at abmp.com more. 